John chapter 12, tonight's message, interesting title, I think you'll find, From Tomb to Table. From Tomb to Table. And of course, that refers to Lazarus. All right, it is <clears throat> it's the night before Palm Sunday. Not right now, but in the Bible. It's the night before Palm Sunday. And I told you that over these last several services, we're looking at what was going on with Jesus prior to Holy Week. He's building up, leading up to Holy Week. So now it's the night before Palm Sunday. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, comes to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at table with him. That's where I got from tomb to table. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the odor of that ointment. All right, let's look at this a little bit. So it's a, he's at Lazarus' house, as we mentioned before, in another message on Lazarus. They were dear friends, personal friends. I think Lazarus' love was when we talked about this. So whenever Jesus would be in the vicinity of Jerusalem, rather than stay in Jerusalem, he'd stay at Bethany, outside of Jerusalem, with Lazarus. His home was open to Jesus. Jesus felt comfortable there. Jesus was about to go through Palm Sunday with the crowds, the questioning, the overturning of the money changers, then the Passover supper, then the arrest, the beating, the final crucifixion and burial. It was going to be a week beyond anything he had ever experienced. So what we see, these are his last moments of peace, friendship, and rest. Where? In Lazarus' house. Can we provide a place for Jesus in our hearts that we are not so full of turmoil constantly that he has a place of peace in our hearts? He's called the Prince of Peace. And he said, I give you peace. Can we accept that peace and live in that state of peace that no matter what circumstance is going on in our life, it doesn't ruffle us, it doesn't throw us. We approach it with confident peace, knowing that he's with us. The other thing I want to mention about this is that everybody that we saw at the last dinner is here, but everybody's changed. They're all, they've all been changed. They've been changed. Now, they knew Jesus, and Jesus had been to their house before. What changed them was the resurrection of Lazarus. Look at this. It says very clearly that Martha served. That's what she was doing before. But last time she was serving, what else was she doing? Complaining. The scripture doesn't say a word about her complaining here. She is serving with pleasure, serving with joy, serving with the knowledge of how the dearest thing in her life was taken away but restored by Jesus. Serving with gratitude, serving with love that there are things far more important than the stupid details of our lives on a daily basis. Things that God wants us to be focused on rather than focused on trivialities in life. She realized that when her brother was dead for four days and Jesus raised him from the dead and restored him to her, she had him back. And she was changed by that. And then there's Lazarus. He sat at the table. He who had been dead four days is now sitting and eating and conversing. And people are coming from all over to see him and to hear him. He must have been sharing the glories of God. He must have been sharing what he saw and what he heard during those four days. I don't believe that he was in, in darkness I don't believe he was in silence. I believe, like the Apostle Paul said, I saw things, I heard things that it's not lawful to speak about. I think Lazarus would have seen and heard some things and people wanted to know, what was it like? What did you see? Who did you see? What did they say? So many questions. And he had the full recognition that he had died. He knew the moment that he breathed his last breath and slipped away. And the next moment that he knew burned into his heart was the moment that he heard Jesus say, Lazarus. 
and life suddenly sprang into his body. He opened his eyes, wrapped and in a tomb. And he knew a miracle had taken place. He was changed. He would never, ever be the same. How could anybody focus on those things I just spoke about, trivial things in life, when you had been dead and called back to life by Jesus himself? And then there's Mary. Mary's in the same spot, at Jesus' feet. We saw her last time, at Jesus' feet. But this time, she's not sitting and listening. She's ministering to Jesus prophetically. She has been changed by this experience with her brother, and she has moved into a new level where now she is ministering to Jesus, not just being ministered to by Jesus. She is ministering for Jesus by fulfilling the scripture, by fulfilling a prophetic word that she is unaware of, but at that moment moving by the Spirit. She's been changed by this event of death that the enemy meant for evil, but God turned into good in so many lives, raising him from the dead. So she is there, and she takes this ointment of spikenard. Spikenard, also called nard. It was highly prized in the Roman Empire. It comes from India and the Far East. It is extremely, extremely expensive. So it symbolizes the best, the best that you would have. Kind of like we use the word the gold standard. They could have used the word the spikenard standard or the nard standard. This could have been the most expensive and most precious thing, and it probably was, that she owned. It may have been a gift to her. Perhaps it was her unused dowry because she was unmarried. Which, by the way, Mary and Martha would be doubly grateful to Jesus because if Lazarus stayed dead, they would have no source of income and nowhere to live. So, she takes this spikenard. Now, it's an alabaster jar. Alabaster is stone. Stone, they would carve it into a nice, beautiful jar, and they would drill a small tunnel in the middle of it. They would fill it with the perfume. They would seal it. And it was sealed tightly. You couldn't just uncork it and use some and cork it. It was sealed. And that's why she broke it. She breaks the bottle of alabaster. She pours it out. This was how you did it in those days. You would break the bottle, break the neck off and pour it out. And she pours it on Jesus. Now, it says the aroma filled the house. And that was something that was so, um, Im not important, but so meaningful or noteworthy about spikenard. It had an aroma that bypassed every other aroma. Um, it's used, it's mentioned also in the Song of Solomon. In the Song of Solomon, it's mentioned that my beloved perfumes himself with spikenard. The symbolism there is that the aroma would be stronger than any other aroma in the household, in the feast, and wherever you are. The spikenard could be smelled throughout the entire house, the scripture says. Now, what happens next is that one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, says, why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, 300 pence is a year's work, a year's salary, salary for a year. That's how precious this was. This little, it was only about that big, probably. I had a couple of jars I was going to bring out, and I forgot to put them in my pocket. It's about that big. They're not alabaster, they're just clay, but I'll show you about the size. And it was worth a year's salary, an entire year's salary. That's how expensive it was. And uh, Judas, he says, this should have been sold. Now, just think about that. What's he implying? Why did you waste this ointment on Jesus? Why did you waste this ointment on Jesus? This should have been sold. And the money given to the poor. Well, that part sounds good, right? That sounds good, like he's got good intentions. But the scripture tells us he didn't care about the poor. He was the treasurer. Now, when people go around and tell you Jesus was poor, I don't know any poor person who has a treasurer, do you? How can, people, how, can, how can anybody preach that Jesus was poor? 
He had a treasurer. He had somebody to take care of the money in the ministry. And that was Judas. Now, Judas was pilfering it. He was stealing from it, skimming for himself, apparently. So the, the scripture tells us. So Jesus says, let her alone. Against the day of my burying has she kept us. Now, this is a, this scripture in the Greek is really fabulous. It doesn't really mean what it says there in the English. Let her alone against the day of my bearing has she kept this. It says this. She sent forth that she may watch over me in the day of my embalming. That is the literal translation. Now, they did not embalm bodies the way we embalm bodies today by removing the blood and putting in, uh, I'm not sure what they put in. In those days, their embalming was sweet spices, wrapping the, the body, and putting on perfume, the different, various perfumes that they would use. That was the embalming he's talking about. But that word in the Greek is embalming. And what he's saying is that she may not know it, but she is preparing my body for burial. And embalming is preparing the body for burial. And that she's been sent forth to watch over me or to take care of me. The word watch over me, the reason I translated it like that is because it is the word for keep. Keep. You know, keep as in King James English, the prison keeper, the guard. That's the word there. So she has been sent by the Spirit of God, by the change in her life, to watch over the preparations of my body for burial. It's basically what he's saying. It's still a week away, but she's already begun the process by pouring this spike nerd on Jesus' feet and then wiping it with her hair. For the poor, you always have with you, but me, you don't have always. Now that is also an interesting scripture because we are called to be benevolent and to feed the poor, to help the poor. But from that scripture, I see that yes, that's a call to give alms, to help, to give. But there's a higher call that we are to serve Jesus. So we give to the people, but we give our all to Jesus. We give everything we are, everything we have to Jesus. We give as needed to the poor. But our, as a born-again, spirit-filled church, our goal is not the poor. We minister to the poor. Our goal is the Lord. We focus on Him, not focus on the poor. The poor will always be with us. He said, you meet all these needs, there'll be more poor over here. You meet all these needs, there'll be more poor over here. He said, but I will not be with you in this way. And she's chosen to focus on me and prepare scripturally for the next step. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. They came not for Jesus' sake alone, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. So you see people are flocking. Now, one of the reasons that Jesus stayed in Bethany Jerusalem at the time had a population of about 50,000 people, about 50,000. During Passover, that population would swell to 150,000. So a city that could house 50,000 people suddenly had 100,000 more people to house. There would be tents put everywhere. It was always amazing, just to digress for a moment. When I lived in Israel, and it would be Passover during... All of Israel's off for Passover. They have two-week holiday at Passover. And uh, at one point, we were working up along the Sea of Galilee. In, uh, it was in March, April. Pastor Mary Beth and I were working there. We were excavating a crusader church. We were excavating because there was going to be a, a major hotel going in there. And we were clearing the site before the hotel could be built. And we discovered a crusader church there. And so we had to hold the hotel, hold up their construction. And you know what, when they're on deadlines and everything, how that makes them feel. And they came to me, because I was the one drawing all the architectural plans. They came to me and they said, can't you locate that church a little more to the south? You know, not really here. So that we could, they, they basically wanted me to fudge the plan so they could build on top of it. And I said, oh, sorry, I can't do that. But it was, it was idyllic. Nobody around, 
January, February, March, the Sea of Galilee was empty, except for some fishing boats. There would be some uh, Druze. Druze are not, they're not, they're Arab, but they're not Muslim and they're not Christian. Um, they're the Druze, that's a specific religion. They would come late in the day and they would walk along the Sea of Galilee. It was so idyllic and romantic. And then Passover came. And when Passover came and all the Israelis were on holiday, they all came camping to the Sea of Galilee. And, when, and I mean, you're talking about the entire nation and there's not a whole lot of places for them to go. So like half the nation was at the Sea of Galilee. They had their tents this far from each other, you know, camping. They're camping right on the sea. They're this far. It was the most amazing thing. But that's how Jerusalem would have been with tent cities going up, people crowding all of their homes that they could cram into, all their friends' houses, all of the, any, any caravanserai outside. So Jesus, rather than be mixed with all the hustle and the bustle and all the crowding in the city, he preferred to be in the suburbs. And so he's in Bethany, a little quieter, a little less crowded, and he could have this meal there. So what happens is the people come out of the city. They know he's there. So they come out to see him and to see Lazarus. If there's anybody, you probably know, if you think, I'm not going to mention any names, but you can probably think of different people who passed away and came back, wrote books about it or had ministries about it, and didn't large crowds go to their services? Didn't large crowds go to hear them speak? Didn't large crowds go to hear what they had to say or buy their books or buy their cassettes or buy their CDs? Yes, it's the same here. People crowd, of course, he didn't have books or CDs or cassettes, but people crowded around. They wanted to see him. They wanted to see this man with their own eyes, this man who was dead, and see for themselves that now he's alive. But look what happens. But the chief priests consulted that they might kill Lazarus. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? The chief priests are going to commit murder against an innocent man who had already been dead, but now God made alive, and they're going to kill him again. If you just think that through, that doesn't make any sense in any way. If he didn't stay dead, I wouldn't kill him. I think, you know, if there's one person I'm not going to kill, it's the one who was already dead, and God raised to life. God must have some purpose. I don't want to go against God and kill him again. But they were actually consulting about putting Lazarus to death. Because, by reason of him, many of the Jewish people believed in Jesus. Why did they believe in Jesus? They believed in Jesus because they came and saw someone who had been dead. And they saw the testimony of all the people who knew he had been dead. He wasn't just dead for a few minutes. It wasn't just he was dead and somebody put the defibrillators on him and said, clear, and he came back to life. It was someone who was dead prepared for burial, put into the tomb, tomb was sealed, and sat there rotting for four days. And he came back to life. He began breathing again, seeing again, hearing again, walking again, and he was sitting there and he was eating in front of them all, sharing what his experience had been. And people were astounded. They saw him, and they saw Jesus. And they knew it was this Jesus who raised him from the dead. They had no explanation for this. They'd never seen this before in their life. The only conclusion they could come to is that this must be the Messiah. This must be the Son of God, the promised one of Israel. So they went back to their homes, and they said, he is going to be coming into the city. He's going to be coming in. And when he comes in, we have got to go meet him. We have got to proclaim what he's done, who he is. We've got to have this public demonstration and welcome him into our city. So this was preparing the way for the Palm Sunday extravaganza. Don't you know that any parade that anybody ever has, you know, the, the Macy's parade, Thanksgiving Day parade, it's not like everybody just shows up on Thanksgiving morning and they have a parade, right? They plan that for months and months. In fact, they're probably planning it now. And the, the balloons that they're making, they're probably making them already now. They don't just, you know, the night before say, hey, you know, I'm going to do a Snoopy balloon. <laughs> they're preparing now. So I have no doubt that these people left Bethany and said, we've got to give him a royal welcome. This is the Messiah. 
We've got to have a, we've got to really bring him into our city and into the temple because he that raised this man from the dead, he's going to deliver us from the Romans. He's got the power, power over death. Certainly he's going to kick the Romans out. We are going to have our land back. We are going to have our temple back. We are going to be free once again. They were excited. They were so excited. Other than the chief priests. Chief priests weren't excited. No. Chief priests were beside themselves with what? Anger and jealousy. If there is a spirit killer, it's jealousy. Have you ever had someone step out in the gifts of the Holy Spirit? I mean, it was astounding. They're not a pastor, pro apostle, teacher, evangelist. They're, they're just in the pew, and they get this word from the Lord. And it, I mean, chills go up and down your spine, and it's just, you know it's anointing, you know it's from God. And then you think, how come I can't do that? Why doesn't God move through me like that? That's the beginning of chief priest jealousy. You want to avoid that. You want to rejoice with how God has moved in their life. You want to support every move of God among every person in the church. It is so exciting. Chief priests, no, chief priests are like, no and no. Sit down and be quiet. We are the chief priests. We have all of the vestments. We are the ones that can go into the temple. Not you, by the way. We can take the blood in on the Day of Atonement. We can offer incense. We can burn the sacrifice. And all the rest of you are good for nothing slobs. You're the rabble. That was the chief priest attitude. Remember? Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like these people. I tithe. I pray. I'm better than them. That was chief priest attitude. And that same chief priest attitude has come down through the generations and is upon people today. You know, just look at some of the high, the high holy churches. I mean, the high holy churches that speak like that. And they look down at a storefront Pentecostal church where they're just rocking and rolling for Jesus. And they say, surely that's not God. That's the devil. If they believe in a devil. I don't even know if they believe in devils. Same thing. It's that high priest attitude. The best part is this. There's still a high priest. He's only one. We don't have a whole high priests. There's one high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has taken the blood into the heavenly holy of holies once and for all and not atoned for our sin, but removed our sin. Removed it, not covered it, removed it, forgiven. It's remitted, it's gone. And he ever lives to make intercession for the saints, confessing the word of God over us. That's why it's so essential that we don't confess our faults. And I'm not talking about telling God our sins. I'm talking about on a daily basis, confessing our weaknesses, our inabilities. We are to be confessing God's word over ourselves because that's what Jesus is confessing. He's not saying we're good for nothing. He's not saying we're weaklings and we compromise. He's saying we're the righteousness of Christ. We're more than conquerors. We have weapons that work. He's calling us to do great things for the kingdom of God. He's speaking life over us. As surely as he spoke life into Lazarus and Lazarus went from the tomb to the table and so can we. It's time for us to rise up and see who we are in Christ. Now, recently, a lot of the messages have been along this line. Sun Tuesday, I think, in particular, if you were here for Tuesday. And I felt a little bit um, out of my league for the last couple of weeks because the request that came in uh, for medical supplies for Ukraine. And I contacted our senators and got form letters in reply, in response. And, you know, we have really, really good senators here. It's their staff who just didn't even answer my questions, just replied with a form letter. Contacted major um, medical supply companies, major pharmacy companies, and everyone, and, and then also the major places like Walmart, Costco, Sam's Club. And everybody got back to me, both at the corporate level and the local level, and said, you know, um, we give, we have a corporate giving program. They all give. 
They all give. We have a corporate giving program, and it's done to the m big players like Red Cross. It goes to, they, they, don't, they, they don't have anything for small players like us. So we, I prayed, continued, we we're praying about it, and God started moving. I think I mentioned to you that we had seven pallets of clothing. Well, they can't use the clothing. So we put that on hold. And we had the ground transportation into Ukraine. We have uh, the permits to get things into Ukraine. There was somebody who was going to do a plane that fell through. So we we're believing for a plane, cargo plane. And over the last 48 hours, um, we've got a cargo plane. And we're all set for the plane to go to South Bend. We're partnering with our friend, Pastor Steve Summerall and Josh, who was down here doing the drywall a few years ago, giving free drywall. Those of you who may be new with us, uh, when the uh, Waccamaw River flooded out home after home after home down in Sacristy, we bought drywall and we contracted with the local places to get it at a good, good reduced rate. And we took it and we gave it for free to the homeowners who had to rip out all their walls. And we would give 50 to 100 boards to every home. And, uh, we, I mean, and we were doing it ourselves and Josh was helping us. So they partnered with us and they bought a lot of the drywall. So anyway, they made available to us 250,000 dried meals. And they need that in Ukraine. So we have the plane, which is going to be going to South Bend to load the dry meals. Now, in the last 24 hours, um, a lot of contacts we've been, been making and made a new contact through Pastor Steve, who was on the phone with me today, he told me about, remember the man John, he mentioned, well, John emailed me. John is a pastor out west. He just got back from Ukraine. He touched base with three pastors in eastern Ukraine. They requested something of us. Body bags. 500 body bags. These are pastors. And level four body armor. These are pastors. Level four body armor. Pastors requiring or requesting body armor. So at the same time, I, I said to John, well, we're working with ex-U.S. Special Forces. I passed on to them. Do you have a line on body armor? Do you have a line on body bags? And then Pastor John got back to me and said, by the way, we have a pallet of medical supplies. It's in either Nevada or Arizona. I can't remember which right now. And if you can use them, we will share everything with you. So we have to see about getting that pallet to South Bend. But this is what God is doing. It's not through the big ones. It's all through believers. It's all through churches. It's all through ministries. It's all through pastors, people who have a heart for Ukraine. So... We want to thank you for all your prayers because all of this is developing and just uh, some of this just before service tonight. I'm getting these emails and uh, texts and phone calls from them. So it's still ongoing, but we have a cargo plane. That was the big thing. And <clears throat> praise God. One little hitch. One little hitch was that the meals are not non-GMO. And Poland does not allow GMO into their country. So we found we can get them through Romania. So we're going to be going through Bucharest instead of through Krakow. So, uh, but, this, but it's moving. It's moving along. So God, I believe we are well outside of who we are. What we're doing, well outside of who we are as a size of a congregation, as well-known ministry. We're not that well-known. We are well beyond but God is honoring our faith and our prayers. And I want to thank all of you for keeping this in prayer. And uh, as we give you the report of what God is doing just right now, it's late breaking news. So let's pray for these pastors in Ukraine. Let's pray. We're going to go to the Lord for our 15 minutes of prayer. Let's pray for the supplies. Let's pray for more medical supplies. Let's pray for the tourniquets, the body bags, the level four armor, body armor. And uh, because with God, all things are possible.